to the mid-semester Canvas update. Uh, this will be a, uh, a brief, fairly, I, I think, brief agenda, but an opportunity to kind of get together in the middle of the semester and give you some updates. I don't know about you, but I, my body is not adjusted to this change in the temperature yet. I'm walking around, it's just like, err, gee. Um, first of all, the kind of a debrief from the Board of Regents visit. I, you know, those that were directly involved, I've had an opportunity to touch base with, but actually talking to the campus as a whole, all I can say is that the board walked away so incredibly impressed with what happens on this campus and the way that which students evolve and graduate and are doing amazing things inside the classroom, outside the classroom. Uh, the partnerships that we've developed throughout the community, I think, really came through loud and clear. The things that we heard were uh, amazing. Um, you may be small, but all we see is mighty. Um, we made new friends, I think. People had not been up here to visit us, had no idea how beautiful the campus looked with all the hard work that went into sprucing it up, um, how hospitable our students were. Uh, I got a note from Regent Jan Mueller, who has been our Regent buddy in the past, and she just went on, and the last thing she said in the note was, and, and your students are awesome. And so, just a huge thank you to everyone who helped make that event a success. I know we had people on tours and students in the library and ambassadors running people back and forth in the rain and poster sessions and the YU staff doing a fabulous job with all the last minute requests and having to flip rooms quickly and the list just go IT making sure everything worked and it did and it was fantastic because that hasn't always been the case in other meetings that we've been in. And so it was just really an amazing uh, moment for this campus and what it represents in the future. Some news at the system level, in case you're not aware, President Cross is retiring this year. So that's big changes afoot. Um, I have been asked to serve and have accepted to serve on the search committee. So that search will probably get kicked off within the next couple of weeks. Um, I think it's a pretty good search group. It includes Regent Re Regina Milner, who uh, went off the board this last year, uh, Becky Blank, the Chancellor of Madison, uh, Drew Peterson, the board chair, uh, Michael Greeby, who's actually chairing the search committee, and Ed Menideeds, who is also our Regent friend and alumni down there in Eau Claire. So it's a nice group. I think optimistically they're interested in having that search wrap up by what they say is third quarter, which would be the middle of our semester next next semester. But that's that's a pretty aggressive timeline. Uh, we, we hope to get a good one that's gonna continue leading the system forward in, in what's challenging times. Uh, just a word about budget. So we know that the budget did pass. We actually have not received the check in our account yet, so to speak. Um, it's 22.5 million. Our percentage is about 1.8%. This is new money. It's tied to the performance <coughs> metrics. Uh, we came out, I think, a little bit better than, than last year, although our retention numbers were down a little bit. So um, that's good. Uh, it equates to about, if Jeff were here, equates to about $365,550, something like that. Um, so we'll let you know when we actually get the final amount and, and quote the check is in the bank because it has not been distributed yet. The other big uh, event that's going on on campus is strategic planning and I've asked Harry and Maria to kind of give you an update because we've got big visits happening next week so I will turn it over to them and they will uh, give you the latest. Chancellor of Academic Affairs and my colleague Gary Anderson, Dean Student Senior Student Affairs Officer. And together uh, we co-facilitate the strategic planning process which our campus has been involved in for going on nine months now but five months of that was pre-work that occurred between uh, March and 
August. In August, we welcomed our external consultants, Keeling and Associates, to join us for two days of intensive work. Many of you were part of those opening sessions. There were all campus sessions and there were over 20 sessions that were held in smaller focus group settings so that the Keeling and Associates team could get to know our campus and hear directly from the people of the campus <laughs> the concerns and the interests and the ideas uh, that needed to be the input phase for strategic plan. So after Keeling visited campus, there was a lot of work that was continued through the strategic planning process. You can see up on the screen, uh, led by strategic planning core team members, that there were 26 scheduled sessions that ended up with a reach of about 162 individuals over a five week period. So those of you that are members of the strategic planning core team, if you are here and you could stand up for a minute, that would be greatly appreciated. Let's give a round of applause to these folks. into doing this. Also, uh, surveys that were developed and sent out, you can see that they went out to students, staff, alumni, business employers, uh, over 1,500 uh, survey responses that came back, and there was also an idea wall that was housed in the YU uh, where students could provide uh, feedback into that. We had over 100 ideas come through that process. So we are getting ready at this point to welcome Keeling and Associates back to campus next week, and we would like to warmly invite all of you to please schedule during one of the four open sessions that will be held. They have been working with the strategic planning core team all fall and inputting all of this data into now what will emerge as the top themes. And those themes are what will be shared with the entire campus during these four open sessions and then one dedicated session for our students. Uh, each session will be done exactly the same way. So it does not matter which session you choose to attend going to hear the exact same summary of the themes and have an opportunity to dialogue with others who are also at your session. Uh, we also have worked with Keeling to convene the first ever to our collective knowledge of the campus, uh, which goes back many years, uh, an all governance meeting, which will also hear the same information, but it's the first time that all of the senates that engage in governance activity will be gathered together at the same time in order to dialogue and talk with each other. So we're very excited about the possibilities of that conversation and what will occur there. So this is coming up next week, November 13 and 14. There are SPCT um, emails that have been sent out with schedule and... And if you don't happen to have the schedule memorized like some of us might, <laughs> uh, we provided it here. And the big thing is we really want to know, did we hear you? So Ken Associates will, will provide the information that's been gathered through all the input sessions and the surveys and we need to make sure that that information reflects uh, what was communicated. So the big thing, we wanna make sure that you were heard throughout this process. You can see that there are two sessions scheduled on November 13th, uh, two sessions on the 14th, and then a student-only session uh, Wednesday evening. So if you work with students or have access to students, please encourage them to show up uh, to this Wednesday evening. We also wanna make sure that all of you uh, are able to make any one of these sessions as well. And you can see the four on the top that are open to all students, faculty, and staff. So please, 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 we need to hear from you once again. Yes, and we've tried to design a process that is inclusive, that is welcoming, that has allowed multiple input points, and that will continue over the coming months as well as we move along our work. Uh, supervisors in the room, we would please invite you to plan ahead for next week in order to create windows of time for all staff to be able to attend at least one of those open sessions. Uh, you'll be hearing from the chancellor on this within a couple days as well. We want to make sure that everyone on the campus has the opportunity to participate. Um, we are very, very proud as an SPCT group of the high levels of involvement. Keeling and Associates has told us many times that this doesn't always happen in processes for strategic planning, but the sheer level of participation that has occurred to date here at UW-Superior bodes well for us, and it indicates that many people are interested in pursuing the future. We're going to be providing next week as well a more detailed process summary of the steps between now moving forward until the end of the academic year and the end of the strategic planning process next week, so please do watch for that information to come forward as well. But mostly we just want to express a great deal of gratitude and a great deal of pride in all of you for demonstrating your care and concern and ongoing commitment 
to the best interests of UW Superior, to our students, to the role that we have in the region, and all the fine work that we all know happens every day here. And thank you. That's a big thank you. Please continue to be involved. Thank you. So Janice and I are going to tag team uh, this uh, last topic, and we also have a special visitor who will be chiming in as well. Mayor Jean King is here uh, as we talk about um, the university and potential partnerships. One of the things that we're going to talk about is the value of partnerships, what it can do for us as a campus, what it can do for our students, um, how that landscape is, is changing out there, and a potential opportunity that is coming our way that we think has the possibility of being exciting, something that we wanted to get on your radar screen, um, and talk to you about what that thing might be able to do. So I want to kind of go back and pick up on some key themes really that we've been talking about both at the campus opening, we talked about it at the Board of Regents meeting, um, and that it has to do with our mission and the vision for the campus. Now for those of you that have been here a long time, when you see the mission statement up there, this isn't gonna be anything new, but for those of you that are still newer to the campus, it's worth putting it up there just to go ahead and revisit it. and the vision. What we talked about at the campus opening was that fundamentally we are about our students and making sure that they have a successful experience with us, that we're able to recruit them, that we're able to retain them, that we're able to graduate them through what we can provide on the campus. Part of the way we do that, obviously, the most natural way is the, is the academic programs that we have in place. So the experiences that they're having, the opportunities that they have to uh, succeed in those programs. Second is experiences that they're getting within the classroom and the experiences that they're getting outside of the classroom. And that includes things such as recreational opportunities, athletics, student involvement kinds of things, and the kinds of services that we're able to provide to them. We know that one of the things that we were trying to really showcase at the Board of Regents meeting was the value of the partnerships that we have, both collaborations on the campus, but also how successful we have been in serving our community and working with our community and in partnering. And I think one of the things they did walk away was, was that sense that we are an engaged campus. We're not just an ivory tower, we are out there boots on the ground in all kinds of ways, in all kinds of venues. Those partnerships, I think, have served us very well and I think are going to be a critical component as we talk about being successful in the future. Good afternoon, everyone. So one of the things that Renee said that we focused on with the Board of Regents, but that's also been a part of our change with our mission and our vision and our value statements within the last five years is partnerships. And we've really been able to to better embrace what we've been doing and what we've done for so long. And so we know how to do partnerships. Partnerships are about win-win reciprocal relationships where we're bringing together two partners, someone from off campus um, as well as on campus and bringing those <laughs> together to be able to have a project, to have a partnership that meets both of those needs. We do within the classroom, the curricular based, we do thousands of students, or over a thousand student experiences every year through academic service learning, through internships, through undergraduate um, research that's community based, and in a number of ways as well that Renee is going to share. So, clearly, one of the ways that we partner is through the academic programs and through other programs on campus, reaching out to community members. And the, and the examples that we could give are many. and. Um, everything from what computer science does with projects for, uh, for partners out there to what music does in terms of touring and providing performances. Uh, the list goes on and on. We also partner in terms of facilities. That you may or may not know. So for instance, 
when the pool had an issue and has an issue, uh, we've been partnering with the Y to still provide programming opportunities and they, they've helped us out. Similarly, we also make use of the high school's field. Uh, the high school makes use of our hockey facility. So those, those kind of relationships are going on all the time behind the scenes. Another way that we partner that maybe we don't talk explicitly about, we, although we talk about workforce, um, is economic development, which really has to do with how are we helping s stimulate and contribute to and encourage a thriving local economy. Because if Superior thrives, we obviously as a university thrive. And if the Twin Ports thrive, we as a university thrive. And that happens in a number of different ways. Um, some of the ways include some of the boards that we sit on, either that I sit on, uh, for instance, I sit on the, the uh, Chambers Board, I sit on the Development Association, uh, I sit on Essentia's East uh, Health Hospital Board, um, and a couple of others as well. That's one way that we're sort of trying to keep in touch with what community needs are, the role that the university can play within the community. Over time, I've also asked Janice to pick up some of those. It started first with, with Cecil, but really it's gone beyond that because there's more venues out there than I can possibly be at. And so I've asked her, for instance, she's sitting on the mayor's economic development team. She sits on Northward, which is regional educators <coughs> that includes Stout, us, Northland, um, WITC looking at transfer agreements and other ways that our, re our region's universities and two-year schools can partner, and a number of other forums as well. I'm going to have uh, Janice talk about some of the things that, that are emerging and have emerged as a result of sitting on some of those uh, boards, particularly with regard to what's happening with economic development within the community. So some of the things that we've been learning, especially in the last few years, that um, about the needs in Superior in our area around economic development, and Mayor Payne may speak to some of these when he's up here, maybe not, um, but what we know is that there's been a number of housing, hotel, and retail needs studies that have been commissioned, as well as a Better City Superior initiative that's taken place. And so with Better City Superior, um, this initiative really began with a development association um, based off of the success of another community, often Utah. There was some synergy that was brought and some revitalization that was done in their downtown area. What they did for better cities is to look at that and how can we learn from that as a community? What can we do to help spur tourism and to, to help aid with economic development? So that's been an initiative that's been going on um, the city and Douglas County also commissioned a housing study back in 2019, where the results of that were finding that within um, Superior and Douglas County, that we need at least another 2,000 housing units every um, 2,000 over the next 10 years, and that was in 2015, so about 200 a year for 10 years. And in Superior in particular, um, the demand was really favoring more rental housing, um, according to the report. And then with a hotel study that was commissioned by the city of Superior in 2017, they're found for a need for additional rooms. And the development association that has underway right now a retail study where they're trying to identify additional opportunities to bring in retail offerings within the community. Don't think Target's coming back, but there could be other opportunities out there um, that they're looking to pursue. So all along what we try to do at the university is, is to look at what are our needs internally and how can we help match whenever possible what the needs are out there in the community, what the data is telling uh, them and figuring out are there ways to make things work. And to tell you the truth, we have some realities on the campus that uh, we try to actually showcase at the Board of Regents meeting, but also some realities that I think are gonna be true, not just right now, but over the next, well, at least the next few biennium. Um, one is that we have aging facilities. One of the things that was really smart probably about 15, 16 years ago was that they took the, the regents at that time on what Jan Hansen would have said was the warts tour. And that means we took them around and showed them all of the crummy places and the things that were falling apart. And uh, at the time, Rothwell Student Center was there. There was not the addition to the Markovich Wellness Center. 
and Swenson Hall did not exist. It was by going on that wards tour that, that funding eventually and acceptance of the capital projects when, when there was money out there uh, was able to be funneled this way to help make those projects a reality. Well, we did that similarly not that long ago. We took them on a wards tour. And the nice thing is, you know, we've got beautiful Swenson Hall. The YU is a really a wonderful showcase piece. Um, the MWC is, is, you know, one of these days going to be primed for some work. Uh, but frankly, our, our fields, our recreation fields, are in miserable, woeful shape. Uh, we have the baseball field is sliding into the creek. Um, the soccer field is unusable because it has concrete and rebar that's popping up through the ground because when they built it, they put fill dirt over construction fill. Um, the football, old football field, Ole Hogsrud, has not been playable because it was never really crowned and drained correctly. So we've got some issues. Um, if we look at our residence halls, as, as, as much work as we put into keeping them maintained and looking the best possible way that they can, these are old facilities. Uh, Crown Heart is our oldest. It was built in the 50s. Uh, that makes that building about 70 years old. Yeah. Um, uh, so we also know that what's happening at the, at the state level is that the amount of money available for capital projects has shrunk considerably. It's kind of surprising because money is cheap right now to borrow, relatively speaking. But they're very, the state is very leery about the, the amount of money that they're spending on capital projects. We've been told by UW's system that there is no new square footage to be allowed. Uh, much of what we're seeing out there is, is very narrowly defined and very narrowly limited. The capital budget was good this year, but they're saying that it, because it was so good this year, it probably won't be good the next biennium. Um, if you look at the way that some of the buildings were funded, particularly the YU, that was built on the basis of student fees. We believe, I believe we have one of the highest seg fees within the UW system. <laughs> so our capacity to look to students to shoulder the burden for development for facilities is very limited. We wouldn't want to do that, I think, from a, from a pragmatic standpoint. We wouldn't want to do that from an idealistic standpoint, and, and right now, there's no way that that would fly even, even if we would do it through the Board of Regents. So our capacity to be able to make those kinds of changes is, is really very limited. Um, we have done a, a master plan a few years ago. We just completed also an athletics study. And we've been watching the higher education landscape. And I will say that even though it sounds bleak, there is hope out there, and the key to hope is the partnerships that you're able to build and secure. Those kinds of partnerships, I think, are becoming more commonplace throughout the country. And so if you start reading and looking at what's happening in higher education, you're seeing a lot more partnerships between community partners, some profit, some nonprofit, and universities to help achieve goals of both the university and the communities in which they reside. And so that's kind of what we're looking at here today. And I, I want, rather than pull examples from across the country, I thought it might be helpful to pull some examples of what we're talking about by looking within our own backyard within the state of Wisconsin so that you could see what some of these look like. And I'll have Janice talk about a couple that are just down the road. So one of the examples is one that just recently got built. It was in fall of 2018 that they opened their doors, but this was a concept that started back probably even before 2012. But what they were looking for with the Confluence project is to be able to have new student housing, retail space, as well as to be able to have a pub, the pub, what's now called the Pablo Center, which is a state-of-the-art performing arts, or state-of-the-art performing arts center. And so there was a number of needs that were relevant at that point for UW Eau Claire within their master plan. They had um, a theater space that was really deteriorating. Uh, if you looked it, it was in what their, their area was, they actually had a sand and a dirt floor for part of that. Um, when you look at what they, um, what they needed in the downtown area was, they had an obsolete theater. They also had uh, a need for downtown revitalization, economic development, and they were looking for an increase in tourism. And so 
This idea came through a partnership, a partnership between UW Eau Claire, um, Visit Eau Claire. Um, there was nine partners in total by the time that they were done to make this happen. Eau Claire Regional Arts Center, Eau Claire County, City of Eau Claire, State of Wisconsin. Um, and what they have now today and what just opened is, sorry, I should have grabbed the clicker, is the Pablo Center. And so we were lucky enough to go down and take a look at the Pablo Center um, later this, or late in the um, summer. And what was there compared to what is now, it's really, really incredible, as well as looking at the economic development that has taken place since they put this up within the downtown area. And so since um, developers and others knew that this was coming up, there's been over 100 million additional dollars of development that's been put within um, their, downtown, um, their downtown area. And so um, they took plans, what was the community needing, what were the things that the campus were needing, how could they work together and create a partnership to be able to do a win-win with this. And so um, they met critical needs, not only with campus, but in the community as well. And then they were able to develop new partnerships and supporter, um, supporters and pave the way for future partnerships for Eau Claire as well as, um, as together. And really it created an atmosphere of what was possible. And so what they're doing now, now that the Pablo Center is done, Eau Claire is a part of the Sontag Center. Um, this was actually just brought to them at the Board of Regents as a concept and they're looking for some funding to be built to help with this project. It's a partnership with UW-Eau Claire, Mayo Clinic, and the YMCA. And what they're trying to do here is be able to bring together what the needs were um, for Eau Claire, which were to have facilities, a renovated basketball, um, some swimming and some pool time with the YMCA, as well as being able to bring in Mayo Clinic, their sports medicine, and their kinesiology um, program at UW-Eau Claire. They're putting this all together in one space. Yeah, just another picture of it as well. And so they're looking to now do this. And again, through partnerships, being able to figure out what they could do together that they couldn't do. And so that's kind of what we've been asking ourselves here is what can we do together with the community that we cannot do on our own, knowing what our needs are and where those sources and, and resources are likely to come from. And so we want to talk to you today about a potential partnership project here at the university. And again, it's looking at those long-term, uh, all of those intentional uh, connections and collaborations that we've had, the conversations that we've had. Um, how do we match the two? So what we're looking at is the north end of campus. And if you are like me and you're like directionally challenged. The north end is the end that has Oleog through field um, out there up across Belknap. And so what we're looking is potential for co-curricular and future academic program space, the potential for an indoor field house with a turf field, uh, potential mixed use housing, a potential small hotel, and potential retail space. And again, part of why this is important is when we look at the needs, and I'll talk about specifically what I think the impact could be on recruitment and retention and, and community needs in a minute, but when we look at the 70-year-old residence hall, the fact that we have unplayable fields, um, the fact that uh, there is no facility within um, this city, given our challenging weather, uh, basically we've got, what, about three months outdoors, maybe four uh, to, in which to operate. Um, looking at space is important. Specifically, what I think the impact has on recruitment is both opportunity <coughs> for students without them getting the, with, where they would be able to see the benefit without having to take on and shoulder additional costs. So specifically, um, if we think about in the field house, that there, is, there is the potential to add uh, athletic teams. Um, there's room for prospective students and parents to stay while visiting UW-Superior. 
they'll be right there. Potential for new academic programs, continuing ed and camp development. It fundamentally alters the image, increases pride because it changes the entrance to campus. Um, that's one of the things that, you know, as lovely as the windscreen is, it's been put up along the fence. Uh, <laughs> That doesn't really disguise what's what's happening on that space, and it's kind of been an eyesore within the city, I think, for a number of years. Retention. When we talk about it again, what are the spaces that students have access to? We know that over, I want to say, 30% of our students use recreation programs within the MWC. This butts up against what happens, this practice time needed for athletic teams. Teams are practicing anywhere from five, six in the morning until one, two at night. Um, our students deserve better than that. Again, we have, we, have, uh, we have services that are not playable. Uh, it creates new space for intramural and athletic teams to be able to do things that they couldn't do before. Newer housing for students in their third year and beyond. It gives them an options to be close here on campus rather than having to go over to Duluth or having to locate somewhere else within the city. Rooms for visiting athletic teams, actually any guests to come visit campus. What does it do for the community? We think it brings new life into campus and the community itself, if you think about what it might potentially do to jumpstart Belknap, in much the same way that you're sort of seeing that revitalization of Tower Avenue happen. It naturally has the opportunity to bring more community members onto campus. This is something we've talked about a lot. Um, so that when you've got people coming in for performances and people coming in to see the theater or music or lectures or all the kinds of things that we do on campus, this is a way to also help bring them here. It'll, it has the opportunity to bring tourists to campus, bring additional youth and high school sports to campus. If we talk about how do we maximize use of the YU, natural for visiting students and their parents to stay right there, especially if they're coming out from the cities or sometimes even beyond. Also for weddings, conferences, and events that could be held on campus. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Chancellor. Thank you, Janice. Uh, uh, I am uh, Jim Payne. I'm the mayor of Superior, and I'm going to try a new political communication exercise. I'm going to try and get through this and maybe every speech ever without using the phrase economic development. Uh, <laughs> the reason for that, I did not tell them I was going to do this. I'm just coming up with this now because uh, I think we can have a larger vision for that. So let me just start by way of introduction. I'm an alumni of UW Superior, and I like to tell everybody that will listen that I'm also a current resident of UW Superior. I live right next door and spend as much time on this campus as any of you. Uh, I, I feel very passionately about this school's history and its future, especially in our community. And uh, let me tell you a little bit why, through what I believe community and urban development should really be. Uh, but first, I want to say what my view of the what the university should be doing, my ask of you in this community is three things in this order. One, educate your students in a comprehensive liberal arts education. Make them into leaders. Please do that first. Second, educate the surrounding community. That is the Wisconsin idea and I believe is your charge as a public university. Help us to all be smarter every day. And finally, as a university, be a citizen within this community. Because my view of what how community development should work is through participation. And I didn't make this up. For anybody that wants to check my overall philosophy, uh, I consider myself a new urbanist. That is an actual, there's a charter of what people like me believe. It was largely founded uh, by Jane Jacobs in her book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. And she led with death of great American cities because people like myself and the chancellor and other leaders in the community usually kill cities. That's what we do. Uh, people like you and the community around us breathe life into communities. I don't have the time to explain to you what new urbanism truly is. I encourage you to look it up. But it boils down to participation. The more people that participate in a community, the more 
quality of life we bring to everybody. And that works through diversity in our urban spaces, diversity of uses over time and through space. That is why I want to partner with the university in the overall development of this community. You have a, a number of resources that we do not have anywhere else throughout Superior. You have art, athletics, you have uh, intellectual debate, academics. You have a whole community in and of itself right here on campus, and I want access to it. I want the rest of this community to have access to it, and I want you and your students and the rest of uh, this campus to participate in the wider community. And we do that by spreading how you, uh, by spreading the physical space of campus, by increasing the uses of it, and bringing more people from the community in. And so finally, I want to say these are just not empty promises. My philosophy for development, for uh, the finances of the city of Superior, is very different than the way Superior has generally operated. You notice know reference to Better City Superior. That was started during a time when the city of Superior and Douglas County had almost no participation in, the, in public private partnerships at all. We didn't put money into things very often in the city. Now we do. By the, uh, by the time I finish my third year in office, we will be wrapping up roughly $25 million in new development in the community, all in partnership with the city financially. In other words, what I'm saying is the finances of the city of Superior are very strong. The economic health of this community is very strong. I've got cash, I wanna spend it, and I wanna spend it in partnership with you to help you bring this university to the rest of the city. Thank you. Jim. So next steps with this process is what we have to do to be able to see if there's interest in a developer really wanting to come in and to be able to, to see and to visualize and provide concepts of what that space could be on Belknap um, is we have to submit a, or just create and distribute an RFC, a request for concept. And so um, finalizing that up with UW system having them distribute that, getting concepts back um, for us to be able to look at those and to see, could this really work? How does this fit? And if that is something that looks like could really work, um, we are then able to go forward with an RFP. RFP has a lot more details. There's a lot more of the agree uh, agreements that would be a part of there with a developer. Um, and, and I think that the most important part with this is that we have some timelines of how we would like to see these things go, um, but the, this, is a, this is a process. Uh, we get to own that process, but there's a lot of different pieces and a lot of different ways and a lot of conversations um, that will happen to be able to make something like this really happen and to work. And so there will be opportunities. This is the, the first time I know that many of you are hearing about this, but there will be opportunities to be involved as we continue forward with this project. <laughs> So these are just some closing thoughts. Um, we think that this is an exciting opportunity for us to consider. Um, it leverages what we have to aid both our students and win-win aid our community. I think it does both. If I were to try to characterize where we are in this process, like this big, we're like at the very, 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 very beginning. This is not something that happens overnight. Um, things like the Confluence Center and the Pablo Center, that thing actually started, I wanna say around 2009, 2010. That took a long time for that project to come to fruition, to get all the pieces in place, to get all the input in, uh, to make it all happen. So these could go faster, could go slower. It's really, it's just so early and at any time, I think there's no guarantee. It could all fall apart. If the financing doesn't work and it can't come together, it could disappear in a heartbeat. But it's something at least we thought that was worth exploring. So again, many, many, many details are still being worked out. Um, you're hearing about this about as early as we ever thought that something might actually look like could, could possibly be explored. And so I wanted to make sure that you did hear about it, that if you've got questions, 
Again, this is as it goes along and evolve, we'll keep you up to date, keep you apprised, seek your input and feedback. And um, other than that, I think it's these are interesting times. So we're happy to take any questions that you might have. So we're having conversations with UW system to ask them what the next steps are. <laughs> How do we actually put something together that goes out, that people can respond to, to come back and go, yep, that'll work, nope, that won't work, you can't put this there, you could probably put that there. Um, and I've got Janice kind of as my point, point person working with both the city and with system to, to get that thing ironed out. The city comes into it because it's something that we want to make sure is meeting everybody's needs. We want it to meet our needs, what it's going to do for our students, what it's going to do for campus, but also trying to figure out how does that dovetail into what the city needs. And so making sure we're all on the same wavelength. At some point, it may, we may try to go after state money like they did with Confluence Center, in which case we want our friends and supporters all to be, we all want to rally together to go do that. So making sure that we're having all of those conversations. Yep. Um, can you just explain about the point about no new square footage and, and this? So system does not want to build, they don't want to build new buildings. It's like they, they know that we've got all of these buildings on campus, all of this deferred maintenance on many campuses. And so they don't want, they don't want to put the money into building new buildings. They don't mind helping with restoring things but they don't want to necessarily put it into new buildings, particularly. So. But there will be it. Well, yes, but the key is who's paying for it. Yep, Jason. The field house, will there be, a, would, and we're really early on, but would there be a track and field? Uh, would this be the, the home of men's women's soccer? Any ideas on the, the new field house with the field turf? We don't. We know that we, at a minimum, it needs to be competition size. That you need to be able to host and do real stuff in it, as opposed to it just being a practice facility. And beyond that, that is literally as far as the concept is. It's one of the huge needs both that we have on, on the campus and that the community has, because there is no indoor space. Yep, Lois. So one of the points where you already do um, stuff that we are starting to have discussions with So the way it would work is we would get some concepts back, and at that point we're really probably coming back to the campus and going, okay, this we think this thing might get some legs. And then seeking what are things that we can do to maximize our utilization of that space, whether that's programs, whether that's other partnerships that maybe we haven't thought about, or could, you know, partners that we could bring in. But it's sort of like let's we're sort of dipping our toe in the water right now just to even see if it's something that could possibly work and what the challenges might be.